All right, everybody. Welcome back to the Age of Information. As always, I'm your host, Adam Patrick, and today I'm joined by Father John Strickland, who many of you will at least know the name because we have been working and lecturing through his wonderful four-part Paradise and Utopia series. Um, but we're going to be talking about something a little bit different today. So uh, Father John uh, has a PhD in Russian and European history from UC Davis, which he received in 2001, and he is the Archpriest of the Diocese of the West and the Orthodox Church of America and the current rector of St. Elizabeth, the New Martyr Church in Poolsbow, Washington, which I was just mentioning to him off air. I'm very familiar with that area, having lived out in Seattle for a couple of years. So welcome, Father John, to the show. How are you? Very well, thanks. It's good to be with you, Adam. Thanks for uh, having me. I definitely appreciate you coming on and this is a long time in the making your um your book the making of holy russia the orthodox church and russian nationalism before the revolution is one of the first um <clears throat> books that i picked up uh back when i discovered the orthodox church about three years ago two eh, two and a half years ago now um, and that led me to paradise and utopia which if we were going to read anything on the show over a period of it's probably going to take me several months to get through it um, I thought that was such a great introduction to the history of Christendom and just laying out so many beautiful points of history and and um, and sharing that with the audience. So I really appreciate your work. And I'd wanted to talk to you about this book because this is I mean, my my mother's side of the family is uh, Slovak, but there's the Slavic origins. And I didn't know anything about any of this stuff. Um, and I'm still a neophyte to it. I, I started reading your book here, which I'll hold up for, for the audience. They can see that. And that led me to reading um, a little bit of uh, Ivan Ilyin's work and also uh, Leo Tolstoy's Christian writings, which I didn't even know existed. Obviously, I'd read his his fiction um, growing up with a humanities professor as a father. Um, and it was very interesting to learn about that time period, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy. Um, but rather than me ramble on, um, it, did you want to discuss a little bit about uh, your background, anything you wanted to add to the bio just to kind of let the audience know a little bit more about who you are? Well, thanks. I, I'm, I'm, I, I was actually getting interested in your your story and what you've discovered there, because it kind of resembles maybe some of what my interests were as I got mm -hmm. I got I got interested in, in Russian history as an undergraduate <clears throat> after reading Dostoevsky's novel, The Idiot. <clears throat> and it's one of those things that, you know, I, I think many people have said it really uh, can change your life. Uh, it, it got me excited about Russian history. And so I I got interested in, in some of the literature too, uh, as well. Um, but no, I don't think I have anything to add to, to what you said there. I, um, I taught, um, I taught Russian history and European history, um, uh, for, I guess a, about a quarter of a century. And, and, and then a few years back started into the book series, uh, which is kind of like a literary or, or written, uh, kind of expression or presentation of, of what I had developed over the course of all that time after getting my PhD uh, in history. I've always loved Russian culture and Russian history. A lot of people have. Um, today, of course, there's a war going on, right? We all know about that. And and so th some of the things one has to say carefully about Russia today, just to make things clear is, um, you know, kind of important there. But um, I've always I've always just loved Russian history. I lived there three years, no, two years. Lived there two years in 95 and 96, uh, 97. And um, and uh, loved, I was in Petersburg. I, I just loved that city. It's a wonderful place. I uh, ho had hoped to get to uh, Kiev, but I never got there. I never got as further away really than some of the Russian cities like Moscow and, and uh, Suzdal and, uh, and uh, Novgorod and places like mm -hmm. that. But it's a, it was really great. And then I was able to publish the book that you just uh, introduced. Yeah, and it's what I, what I really liked about um this book was it it was difficult to um i, I realize you're not writing it as an apologetic it's not a, a uh, you're not taking a side uh if i hadn't known anything about orthodox christianity and i wasn't familiar with you uh, it's just it's a straight historical text and it's interesting because not many books take that approach anymore there's usually a, a narrative that's trying to be told um and i like it because it's it's well you can tell me your intentions and your thoughts but it's presenting the idea for the audience of Russian nationalism and sort of creating a collective national culture based around Orthodox Christianity in a time in Russian history, which is the late 19th century, mid to late 19th century, where uh, it seems that it was sorely needed. Um, <clears throat> and I see a lot of parallels now. Uh, there isn't really a sense of American 
Christian nationalism within the Orthodox Church that I can tell, but I definitely see it within some of the more evangelical um, mm -hmm. Christian movements that are going on. So I was reading a lot of parallels into that and um, not having a, an argument presented for one or the other side in the book was nice. It was a refreshing way to look at um, to look at this history and then kind of dissect it and go, is it a good idea? Is it not a good idea? Maybe it was the only idea. <laughs> you know, there could have been worse ideas. So what were, what were your, some, of, uh, some of your thoughts when you were writing it and trying to keep it uh, measured and sort of just uh, plainly historical? Yeah, right. <clears throat> well, there's always a narrative, right? If you're telling the, you're telling the story of something, if there's always going to be a narrative. In this case, I didn't want to present a strong opinion about things. I really wanted to be as objective as I could be. Um, I mentioned my interest in Dostoevsky and, and my love of Russian history and culture. And so in a certain sense, that kind of already identifies me as someone who you know, wants to find the good things about that history, uh, present them and, and, uh, and, and bring them to light. You know? uh, but this thing about Russian nationalism is a problematic thing, for sure. Um, as a, you know, uh, a, a lot of the, the, the main part of the work was done um, uh, as, a, as a doctoral student, uh, both in uh, California, but also living in Russia and then back in California. And, um, and certainly, I think I wanted to, to be really honest, even, you know, uh, critically honest about the disruptive and negative consequences of adhering to an ideology as i see it that's what nationalism is it puts the nation first mm. uh, the way liberalism puts the individual first and socialism puts the worker first nationalism puts the nation first before everything else when it comes to political ideals and for me that's a that's a big that's a very problematic approach to uh to life and civilization um, I, I have a chance to talk about this much more broadly in the uh, book series you mentioned, Paradise and Utopia, The Rise and Fall of What the West Once Was. The last volume uh, released last year was, um, you know, really a study of how bad ideology can become. Mm. Um, I always present traditional Christianity in, in kind of uh, opposition to ideologies like this. So back to your question, what was I trying to do? I think what I was trying to do is to see in these. Um, so the thing is, is the, the book is really a study mainly of, of, of Christian, specifically Orthodox Christian um, advocate, advocates of nationalism, uh, something that is fr frankly rather new, uh, yeah. certainly in a modern nationalist sense. Um, there hadn't been a lot of, um, I, I call it the making of Holy Russia, this idea that there is a Holy Russia is, is, is an ironic title because either there is or there isn't. It, it's kind of like this idea among its advocates that it's always been there and we need to maybe restore it, but it's always been there. And I was arguing that while there was certainly holiness in Russia historically, there was a specific conscious effort to, appro to appropriate basically a secular ideology like nationalism and use it to advance the goals of the Orthodox Church in the years before the Russian Revolution, about yeah. 100 years ago. And I think that that was problematic. And so my um, criticism, my, my critically honest approach to it was to see when these advocates got it wrong. I call these advocates Christian patriots, uh, more than nationalists, because mm -hmm. as I say in one of the chapters that deals specifically with their efforts to engage nationalists proper, they were critics of nationalism. They weren't um, unself-conscious adherents of nationalism. They used um, nationalism to promote the, the, the goals of, of, of universal Christianity at that time. And, uh, and they were critical and they called nationalists to account when they needed to. Uh, when anti-Semitism arose, when um, militarism arose, um, it was they that often that were the most critical of the nationalists. So in your, <clears throat> excuse me, in your book, and just this is jumping around a little bit in the <clears throat> introduction, um, but you write, so little attention had been directed to the leadership of what proponents believed was the leading source of nationality, the church. This may be explained in part by the fact that until the middle of the 19th century, the Orthodox clergy were not a natural ally to those who promoted a modern model of nationality. 
a model of nationality in which culture and ancestry assume leading roles threatened its conception of the quote universal church the tension between ecclesial universalism and national particularism had been addressed and resolved by the earliest Christians who were forced to confront the fact that the multinational church of the first century lacked the ethnic unity of its prototype Old Testament, Old Testament Israel. The authors of the New Testament, therefore, place special emphasis upon the universal scope of the Christian faith. And <clears throat> even before um, I had discovered the Orthodox Church, I always found, uh, and I think this is really the tension between somebody like uh, Tolstoy and Ilian, is the tension between the the what is seems to be obvious universality of the church in scripture and how that tends to play out in human history. Um, and it, I was going to start with the, the history of Russia, as I'd sent you in the notes, I thought it might be interesting to, to, um, cause I could foresee a question coming. Um, mm -hmm. how would you, and you write about this in your, in your book series, the other books, um, how would you differentiate maybe what's going on in the book here about with Russia from, uh, Byzantine symphonia, for example. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so that term symphonia, as a lot of your audience I'm sure knows, uh, is a technical term usually applied to the model of um, the relationship between the emperor and his governmental apparatus in Byzantium and leaders of the church, who, which leaders were the patriarch of Constantinople and other bishops um, in, in uh, uh, in support of the Patriarch of Constantinople. Um, and this idea is that there'd be a symphony, uh, a harmony, uh, a cooperation between those two entities within Byzantium. Byzantium was a uh, you know, predominantly Christian uh, state. And so everyone living in Byzantium was both Byzantine, politically speaking, and Christian, religiously speaking. Um, the idea of a separation of church and state is a very modern thing. Mm. Uh, and, and that's really a post, um, post reformational, um, development in the West that really doesn't arise in, in Eastern Christendom in Byzantium, Russia, or elsewhere, um, until very, very modern times. But the idea of that symphony you spoke of, um, I think, you know, the way it worked in Byzantium could never be just some, somehow lifted out and put into, say, America, you know, or something like that. And to see how it was um, disruptive in the case of Russia, which had a long history of that close relationship. But I want to emphasize it's so very modern. It, I don't like using the term church state relations for that civilization because it wasn't like you had a church and you had a state and they had to have a relationship. They, they were overlapping, integrated um, entities um, within that state. Uh, it's a very modern concept to think of. This is a very Western and kind of post-Roman Catholic concept. Is The papacy establishes itself in the 11th century above the state. And then the, the different states of, of the West, of Western Europe, begin to rebel against that, most famously during the Reformation, uh, uh, in the case of England, Henry VIII declares himself the head of the church. And so you have like, who's the head over whom? And you get this conflict, wars break out, the wars of Western religion. Um, and then there's an effort to say, let's keep the two separate. And then let's figure out how they relate to each other. And should they have a relationship with each other? And that brings us back to the question of symphony. But that was really not the question raised um, in, by Justinian and other emperors of Byzantium that used this concept of symphony. <clears throat> that was just a different time. And you would say maybe that it what's really reliant on this working really is the culture itself kind of has to accept mm. a level mm. of responsibility, holiness, spirituality. Uh, if If that isn't part of the ethos of the culture, if that doesn't make up the culture, then you're going to end up with a slew of possible issues, whether it's the Roman Catholic authority structure or the Protestant non-authority non structure or, you know, different models of statecraft. And I like that term statecraft that you, you use often different models over time of how that interacts with whatever Christian church is prominent in that area. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think you got it. I think I think it's a cultural question uh, rather than, a, say, a political kind of administrative question, mm. legal constitutional question. I think. 
what I'm interested in is the, the culture uh, of a civilization. Uh, in the case of the making of Holy Russia or in the case of Paradise and Utopia, like what is a Christian culture? What does it look like? And what does it support? <clears throat> so, okay, that's a great segue then because we should start probably with, um, I mean, maybe it's uh, Cyril and Methodius, maybe it's Vladimir, Grand Prince Vladimir, but the, the bringing, let's say, of Christianity to the Slavic people um, it's a fascinating story just in and of itself and kind of how that works itself up into the beginning of the narrative in your book. Yeah, so my narrative gets underway in the late 19th century, the so-called late imperial period, which is what um, a professional Russian historians call the period more or less from um, the assassination of Tsar Alexander II in 1881 to the Russian Revolution of 1917. <clears throat> it's a, a tumultuous period. Uh, and it's when all those, you know, a lot of those great writers were active and things were really happening in Russia. Uh, time of, well, Do Dostoevsky dies in 1881, but Tolstoy is still, still out there and stuff like this. Well, the background to that late imperial period that I talk about in the making of Holy Russia is, you know, 900 years of Christianity. In fact, my book starts and is launched with an event, an anecdote, a story, a prologue, as it were. Um, which was the commemoration of the 900 year anniversary of the baptism of Rus, it was called, the baptism of what in most English translations until recent time we called simply Russia. But today, as I said, when we were introducing the, the program, I want, I want to make it clear that when I say Russia, I don't mean to exclude Ukraine or Belarus or any other Slavic um, uh, people that were part once of the Russian empire. It's just it's, it's just a historical kind of cultural convention that we speak about that big empire as Russia, um, beginning with Vladimir in, in, the, in the 10th century. So for about 900 years, from 988 to 1888, uh, Russia had, had, had developed a very strong, vital, orthodox Christian culture. Um, Vladimir, it was the grand prince of Kiev. Uh, people technically would call him call that state Rus, R-U-S. <clears throat> Again, our English language generally has historically called it simply Russia and not get, gotten too technical. I bring bring these distinctions out in my in my book, but um, here they probably don't need to, a lot of attention. But for about 900 years, you've got a really vital uh, Orthodox Christian culture. It's got its ups and downs for sure. There's a Mongol invasion that um, disrupts a lot of um, certainly the Russian state. Uh, then you've got, um, you've got some other things going on. You've got an old believer schism that happens in the 17th century. The rise of Peter the Great secularizes the Russian state. Catherine the Great <clears throat> weakens the monastic, um, you might say the monastic anchor. Um, and, but you've got a long period and it was this legacy this inheritance that the what I call the Orthodox Patriots or Orthodox patriotism of the late 19th century was designed to restore and even expand. And they were using nationality and a, and a narrative or story about the, Ru Ru the Russian nation um, to advocate why with this rich Christian heritage, Russia in the modern age should be a nation state, not an empire so much as a nation state, but with one with a um, orthodox Christian and therefore universal Christian um, identity. And that's the fascinating um, paradox of orthodox patriotism, as I define it in the book. We uh, well, I was going to say you talk about um, a couple of points in the introduction that are I think I think maybe helpful to get into and one is Metropolitan. I'm just reading my notes here. Metropolitan Alarion, who I'm saying that right of Kiev, uh, 1051 to 1055. Um, the uh, basically stating the Russians are direct successors to Israel. You have the Byzantine Empire collapsing, uh, the Ottoman Turks in 1453, and then Monk Philippe, I believe I'm saying that correctly declares basically the Muscovite Russia is the third Rome. There's a lot of very bold statements there um, that you, um, I'm not saying that's abnormal for the time, but I think it was surprising for me to hear, uh, to see the torch kind of pass from uh, the Byzantine Empire to the Russian, whatever it was at that time, nationality, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, empire. Uh, and 
yeah, those those very bold claims are kind of important, I think, to realize that when people look at Russia today or even when they're reading the part in the book, the 19th century that you're talking about, um, how important this was to the history of these people. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> For sure. Very important. And um, I think especially today we see that again. <clears throat> uh, pardon me. As Russia, you know, um, as a state defines herself, you know, in distinction from and even against the West, however the West is understood, progressive, whatever, globalist, whatever terms one wants to use there, um, Russia is looking today to her distant past, to the, the same past you, you just summarized, to make sense of who she is to define herself. And I think that that's one of the fascinating things about Russian history in the modern age uh, is that um, her, you know, our, those who articulated that history so often go to Orthodox Christianity to do so, so often do that. And the people you just mentioned, uh, you know, uh, Fila Fie, for instance, he was a, a monk um, and uh, lived in the in the uh, in the 15th century, and he was the one who coined this oft quoted um, but problematic term, Third Rome. Uh, your your listeners may or may not be familiar with that term, so I'll summarize what it meant. It was an idea, and therefore an ideology. It, it's not Christianity as such, although it makes use of Christianity just like the Orthodox patri Patriots of my book do, uh, it made use of um, nationality to promote Christianity. And he was, after all, a, a, a Christian apologist, as it were. And what he was saying was, is that um, in the 15th century, in the late 1400s, the last um, great uh, Orthodox power has fallen, which was Byzantium. You mentioned 1453, that's the year Constantinople finally falls to the Muslim Turks and it's no longer, there's no longer a Byzantium. The Ottoman Empire springs out of that. Before that, there was, that was the second Rome. And in fact, Constantinople in, in early Christian writing often was called uh, New Rome, New Rome or Second Rome, New Rome uh, to distinguish from the old Rome in Italy. Um, and that was the fall of the second Rome, Constantinople. The first Rome, of course, had been in Italy, and uh, from the Orthodox point of view, that had fallen away from Orthodoxy with the Great Schism of 1054. So you've got this universal church, you know, with many nations participating in her history. Then the West falls away from this is all. all this is the way of thinking. I'm not saying this is how it has to be understood, but mm -hmm. falls away in the 11th century. Uh, Rome does, leaving just the Orthodox Church in the East dominated by Byzantium with its capital, Constantinople, which is conquered by the Turks. And, and then Philofe says, and there's a third Rome, and that's Moscow, and there shall ne be, never be a fourth Rome. In other words, we are kind of the eschatological fulfillment um, of, of Christian history as a nation. And as a nation, we have a, um, a uh, calling, a kind of ministry in history to preserve Orthodox Christianity until the end of time. Mm -hmm. Very, you know, kind of messianic kind of uh, way of thinking. I have to say, um, this doctrine of the Third Rome was not widely um, adhered to in, in, in Muscovite Russia, the Russia under Mo Moscow uh, influence uh, for many centuries. Um, it did reappear in the time that I'm talking about in the 19th century, again, as a product of Orthodox patriotism. Can you touch a bit on um, Peter the Great, Catherine the Great, and the old believer uh, schism, I guess we'll call it? Uh, and because and in, I, I think at least if people aren't Orthodox Christians listening, they're going to at least have heard the name Peter the Great, Catherine the Great. And even within the Orthodox, maybe online Orthodox community, Every now and then you'll get old believer that'll mm -hmm. fall into a sentence or an argument somewhere. It's an interesting, um, there's some interesting parallels that people can assume or draw or posit uh, to what's happening today versus that. So I think maybe it's good just to touch on those, those three topics real quick before we segue. Yeah, you bet. And, you know, it's interesting in my book, I actually have a whole chapter on the old believer place in all of this because they, they do offer a really fascinating uh, insight into Orthodox patriotism in Russia. So um, the old believers came first. So in the 17th century, 
Muscovite Russia, and by Muscovite Russia, what I mean is um, a Russian state that is ruled from the city of Moscow, the capital of Moscow, distinct from an earlier state, Rus, Russia, I don't want to get into the distinctions, ruled from Kiev. And between those two periods in Russian history, um, you've got the Mongol invasions that disrupt the state. So you start off with Kiev in the 10th century, Vladimir of Kiev. Then there's the Mongol invasions a couple of centuries later, disruption. Then there's a new state created under the autocracy of the czars of Moscow uh, that lays a claim to that earlier history of Kiev. A lot of what goes on today and the polemics between Ukraine and Russia center upon this relationship across time between Kiev and Rus or Kiev and Russia, and Muscovite Russia. Um, but within the Muscovite period <clears throat> that lasted all the way up until Peter the Great, Peter the Great, we can just date to the 1680s. We'll just leave it at that. Up until this time, um, Orthodox Christianity was still a vital force in this state we call Muscovite Russia. But then um, there was an effort to reform the church life of that state um, that provoked a reaction a reaction that became known as old belief or the old believers. And the, the reform was an effort to change some of the details of liturgical worship and um, other things like making the sign of the cross, things which um, are certainly not at the center of, of Christian tradition. And one of the things the old believers did is they reacted strongly um, to things that seemed to violate the Russian character of the Orthodox Christianity they practiced mm. because these reforms actually tried to bring Russian Orthodox practice into, uh, into um, kind of uh, um, uh, assimilate it with Greek Orthodox practice. And some of these old believers, one famous one was named Avakum of the 17th century said, wait a second, if we're the third Rome, if we're the ones who kept the faith alive while those Greek in, Greeks in Byzantium got conquered, uh, why should we try to accommodate them and their practices? And so they made a very nationalistic reaction to these reforms that resulted in them being excommunicated and, and creating their own separate identity within Russian Orthodoxy that lasted for centuries, uh, you know, all the way up to the present. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a large community of them in Erie, Pennsylvania today. There's a large community in Canada. Um, they're scattered throughout a lot of the uh, world. And they're found in Russia, too. I once attended a uh, old believer church service in Moscow when I was when I was visiting there once. Uh, yeah, so they're still out there. Sorry, I, I was surprised to hear that, that <laughs> because it, it, you wouldn't think that something like that would last. But I mean, when people are, are really dedicated to something, then I guess it, it just keeps lasting into perpetuity. But what's interesting is it seems like what these reforms were trying to do was more um, go not not change to move forward, but go back to something that had been maybe corrupted in. That's how it was understood. And that's a reformational kind of tendency. I bring attention to that in my book series, Paradise and Utopia, that doesn't have a whole lot of place in the history of Eastern Christianity as reform, like uh, leadership, like patriarchs and bishops saying, hey, things are all bad. We've got to change it you know, fundamentally. That was the mistake made by the reformers that provoked these old believers into their schism. Mm. Um, but you just said something very interesting. You said you're surprised it, it lasted. It had the staying power. It did because of the other um, important historical event you just um, you just spoke of, and that's the rise of Peter the Great. Catherine the Great. So Peter the Great and Catherine the Great um, dominate the 18th century, the 1700s. The age uh, when in the West, enlightenment, so-called enlightenment, um, is just taking off and secularization is really transforming statecraft in the West. And we might want to spend more time talking about this, I think, uh, Adam, but I'll, I'll just try to summarize quickly. You can bring me back to talk more about details there. But what happens is Peter basically appropriates Western models of statecraft, largely secular in character and very top heavy in the sense that the state would now dominate religious life. And he, you know, Henry VIII's Anglican church, for instance, the a Lutheran church in, in Prussia was another example. 
and to impose these on Russia. And since this, the old believer schism had just taken place and was stirred up with this fervent sense of nationalism and patriotism, those communities of old believers seemed to have their justification for having gone into schismatic kind of reaction against the official church, the Orthodox church, um, because it now seemed the state was going in the way that the West was going in, which was to, to diminish the influence of Christianity and to highlight the importance of worldly secular interests. And so that's one of the reasons why they had that staying power you just asked about. Yeah, I think it's important to highlight that because we sort of see, I mean, we see that 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 same trend play out in little snippets kind of all over the place in modern world or modern mm -hmm. society where, mm -hmm. you know, uh -huh. um, it you definitely see it. Not that I watch the news because I have more respect for my brain and emotions. And, <laughs> but uh, I mean, if somebody were to tune in and look at kind of the the argument made from Russia today against the United States of America, maybe something like that, we don't have to get into politics, but it's really against you know, uh, the, the music, the secularization, right? The modernity, the lack of morals, the, the focus on money and, you know, and, and there's no real homogenous belief system other than just acquiring wealth and stamping out your enemy. And, and Russia positions itself now as sort of the defender of morality, whether or not they actually mm -hmm. are, I think is up for, up for debate, but that's mm -hmm. their position. And so you just see the same trend play out over and over in history. Well, in modern history, you might want to say modern history, because it is a very modern phenomenon right. that doesn't belong to Byzantium or even early Russian history or early Western history either, actually, for that matter. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, OK, so mm -hmm. we'll uh, maybe start with what. Uh, so what exactly is going on in 1888 that is uh, of such great importance? Uh, how is it sort of who are the players involved here? You talk a lot about different people in politics, different clergy, artists, uh, painters, writers, mm -hmm. um, and everybody kind of having a, a say in this sort of uh, milieu that's going on in, uh, starting around 1888. So you, you mentioned the uh, kind of baptism of Rus in 988. This is the thousandth year celebration, or sorry, 900 year celebration, yeah. elementary math, sorry. Um, and maybe talk a little bit about what's going on at that time. Yeah. Well, and you mentioned the millennium or thousand year celebration was actually a big event at another stage in Russian history, which is this late Soviet stage, mm. 1988, um, the commemoration of the baptism of Rus under Vladimir was a very politically charged event in the, in the cultural and political history of a collapsing Soviet Union. Um, but we won't get into that right now anyway. Nine, uh, 1888 uh, has its own unique uh, characteristics. This is a time when the Russian autocracy uh, led by its Tsar, and Tsar is just a Russian form of Caesar, Emperor, the Russian Tsar, um, at that time was Alexander III, soon it would become Nicholas II, the last Tsar of Russia. Nicholas II lived, uh, ruled from 1894 to 1917, and his, his father, Alexander III, <coughs> uh, ruled from 1881 to 1888. Alexander III, Nicholas's father, um, came to power when his, his own father was assassinated in 1881. That assassination in 1881 creates a, a political, but also a cultural environment of crisis in, in the Russian Empire. That empire was a multinational, multi-religious empire. That is to say, the Russian people, modern Russian people, speaking more or less modern Russian, dominated it, but there were many other peoples as well. <clears throat> there was increasingly a people known as Ukrainians at that time. Historically, what we call today the Russians and the Ukrainians had no real national distinctions. A thousand years ago in the time of Vladimir, <clears throat> there were no Russians versus Ukrainians. They were Eastern Slavic peoples. Uh, they spoke a similar language um, and things like this. Um, but by the late 19th century, largely uh, or partly, I should say, under uh, what happens is, is you get the formation of different nation, national communities within the Russian Empire, some of which really wanted independence of the Russian Empire, some for good reasons. Uh, a large number of Poles lived in the Russian Empire, which had gobbled up, along with a couple of Western powers, Poland uh, in the 18th century. And so there was a strong Polish nationalism that tried to separate itself from 
Russia, that legacy still lives on today in some of the politics around NATO and Russia uh, in the case of Poland or the EU there. Um, uh, there are other countries and the nations in the East, I mean, to say nothing about Central Asian peoples or, or that kind of thing, Georgians in Caucasia. Um, so what I'm trying to say is Russia in uh, 1888 is a very diverse place. And now it's clear that with the example of modern statecraft in the West, um, Russia perhaps doesn't offer the best uh, political system for its peoples especially those who are not Russians, who want to have a better way of life, different way of life, and maybe want to break free of the Russian empire, or at least have reforms made there to benefit them. But as part of all that political kind of um, crisis, there's also a real religious crisis. And that is that the Orthodox Church in Russia has been sapped, uh, its, its strength has been sapped by that old believer schism of the 17th century. Now, granted, it's been 200 years, but the most vigorous, the most like zealous um, Christians in the Orthodox Church tended to be those who were gravitated toward old belief because of its kind of radical stand against modernity and secularization and things like that. And so the, the institutional or official Orthodox Church by the late 19th century in Russia is really weakened significantly by that and also by the fact that under the new secular-minded state like Peter the Great and Catherine, the um, autonomy and vitality of the or official Orthodox Church is really weakened by the top-heavy domination by the state. Sometimes the church is at this time called the handmaiden of the state mm -hmm. because of its subordinate position. Its bishops didn't rule autonomously the way they should according to the canons of the church, of the Orthodox Church, but were often being appointed and 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 reappointed and and uh, moved around, so they never had any real um, vital uh, pastoral care for their people. There are many other problems at this time in the in the Russian Orthodox Church, and so what's going on at the celebration of 1888 is the 900 year anniversary of the baptism of Rus is an effort to revitalize the Orthodox Church in this Russia, this Russian Empire amid all these crises. And, the, and the, the, the thing they land on is nationalism. Modern secular nationalism can be mined for its ideological uh, content to give Russia, the Russian empire, its, its, its members, a sense of identity that is both loyal to the Tsar and integrated into the Orthodox church. And so these Orthodox patriar patri uh, patriots, um, they, they organize this festival to try to celebrate kind of the, what they consider to be or argued was the national heritage of, of Russia, which is Orthodox Christianity. Mm -hmm. And that's really interesting because that doesn't really show up in a lot of the other nationalist movements throughout the modern West, in America, in France, in Germany, in England, in Italy. Spain, you don't see this as much. You see some of it, and we might want to do some comparisons, but but really Russia was in a particularly, um, a, a really interesting situation where to argue the Orthodox Christian historical card was also um, to argue the nationalist card or to present the card. I'm mixing my metaphors there. Yeah, actually, maybe it's worth getting into. You, you do talk about it. Um here the comparisons with nationalism in, in other countries and and the reason i think it's, it's just so fascinating to hear about is because i mean that word nationalism it's not like there's not a human being who's going to hear this that hasn't heard that in their day-to-day -day life at some point in the last four to eight years right that's that always comes up patriotism nationalism mm -hmm. it's either a, it's either a great word or the worst possible thing on the planet depending <clears throat> on which side of the dialectic you're stuck on so yeah. yeah it is important to talk about what's going on in other countries at that time france germany england yep yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and what's interesting is, is um, you know, a lot of these countries are defining themselves more and more in secular terms. Like if you look at um, a unified Germany after Bismarck, uh, Otto von Bismarck unites Germany in 1871 from a kind of a group of 30 some different German states into one German. <clears throat> what you see with, Biz with a united Germany 
is a much more secular definition of what it means to be German than you find in Russia among these Orthodox patriot, patriots that I'm talking about. They're arguing to be a true Russian means you're a faithful son of the Orthodox Church. Mm. Whereas in Germany, to be a true German means you identify with like, you know, the music of Richard Wagner or something like that. Or if in England you identify with the colonial system that rules, you know, Britannia rules the waves and we have our empire in uh, India and South Africa and uh, places like this. Um, America, it's, you know, another kind of ba bag altogether. So you, but you don't get such a vigorously an eschatological argument for nationalities you get in, in uh, Orthodox patriotism in Russia. Do you think that was, this is a speculative question, but do you think that is somewhat inevitable or could it have gone in a different direction or were the tides just sort of so heavily slanted in that direction of nationalism based on collective Orthodox belief um, that it kind of just had to be that way? No, I don't think it had to go that way. And <clears throat> I want to emphasize these Orthodox patriarchs, patri I keep on patriots that I'm talking about in the book, they were actually arguing against secular nationalism. Mm -hmm. of which there were a lot. So like the most common term for what you might call ethnic nationalists in Russia at this time are known as the Black Hundreds. That's a nickname they got. And it was these Black Hundreds that were really scary. I mean, they would they would organize armed mobs of pogroms against Jews took place in the Western borderlands. There's a horrid um, um, a pogrom against Jews in Kishinev, uh, uh, Moldova, um, uh, at this time in 1913. So there was a lot of ethnic violence, well, not a lot, but there was certainly some ethnic violence and it was being driven by an ethnic definition of nationalism. Um, a comparison, Adam, you might make, you know, that kind of universalizes it is the lead up to World War I, which most historians would say was an outbreak of, of, of secular nationalism. I mean, the the outbreak of World War I was, was driven more by nationalism than anything else. And in Serbia, which was a very small power at this time, um, the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria in 1914 is the, 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 the fuse that ignites the whole bomb of World War I. Well, it had been, that assassination had been uh, carried out by an organization called the Black Hand which was a group of Serbian nationalists, ethnic nationalists, who had kind of defined themselves against everything German. Like, we are the mortal enemies of, of, Germ of Germany. And it's, it's Serbia against Germany in the form of Austria being a predominantly German state. And this idea of ethnic divisions was really more, more and more found. It's still found today, sadly, um, in all parts of the world, including Russia and Ukraine. And... Um, and what these Orthodox patriots were trying to do is avoid and, and, and forestall, preclude the possibility of ethnic conflict by, 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 by celebrating and advancing the, the Christian values of harmony, unity, love, um, universality. And so th that's what's fascinating about this group of people that I studied is they always had this paradox. It was, a, in, it, um, it was really a irreconcilable um, contradiction, I think, but they had this paradox between trying to advance the formation of a modern Russian nation state, uh, but doing so on the basis of a universal faith, Christianity, whose highest ideal was love and turning the other cheek. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems it's such a daunting task. And it, it's easy, I think, for, you know, people who aren't well studied in this, including myself, to sort of uh, retcon back into the history, whether it's a nation or a faith or a people, uh, <clears throat> modern day talking points about such things. And, you know, you point in the book to the sort of massive amount of canonizations that occur over a you know hundred year period in various spurts. Um, and uh, that's not, I'm not saying that that shouldn't have been the case, but there's definitely a, a push to sort of um, prom make more prominent the Orthodox Church in a society maybe where it wasn't as prominent as it should have been. Um, and then we today sort of are still recipients of that narrative where we maybe don't realize that it has hadn't always been as uniformly Orthodox as we're somewhat led to believe. Does that make sense how I worded that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think it does. Uh-huh, yeah. Um, 
yeah so i think it would be good we could talk a little bit about um czar nicholas because that, that just kind of running with the theme i just mentioned um he's obviously an orthodox saint uh i, I just saw a meme today not a meme a, a paper that came up on i'm probably not gonna be able to find it oh yeah the cosmic mm -hmm. significance of czar nicholas the second i didn't read the, the paper but it was on an orthodox website um i'm wondering you know how was how was uh, Nicholas the second seen at that time? Was he was he seen the way that we maybe less educated people who are on the internet see him now? Was he sort of created into uh, a figure that he wasn't? Uh, it seems like he there were times where he could have stepped up to the plate and kind of didn't, um, but he also led it seems like a very holy life. He's a very interesting figure. And my, my mm -hmm. point to bring this up is I think sometimes we oversimplify folks like. Nick, sorry, Nicholas II, in order to drive uh, current modern narratives, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think you're right. <clears throat> well, um, you know, Peter the Great had transformed the Russian state into a really powerful autocracy that required, <laughs> uh, for its really effective um, um, administration, a czar uh, about as powerful and competent and ambitious as Peter was. Nicholas was not that czar. Nicholas was a reclusive, um, uh, somewhat simple-minded, um, and I don't mean that as an insult, I just mean that as like he didn't have a really complex, dynamic sense of politics the way Peter did, um, man. And, um, and so Nicholas stepped into um, a office, the czar and autocrat of the Russian Empire, the, great, the largest state in the world, and one of the five great powers, um, to, to try to um, rule that at a time when, if there was ever a time for, for the need of really firm, visionary leadership, um, that was the time. And we've been only talking about nationalism, which is really not the biggest disruptive force. Socialism and revolutionary politics are the big disruptive force. That's what took the life of Nicholas II's grandfather, Alexander II, who, by the way, Alexander II had had issued a series of reforms to try to make the state more Western, more modern, more efficient. The biggest of which was to liberate all the serfs of the, of, of the Russian empire. 50 million serfs were liberated with his signature as autocrat. Mm -hmm. I, by comparison or rather contrast, the United States to liberate um, our slaves um, required a civil war that would turn out to be the worst war in our history because of our democratic kind of political system where power was distributed so broadly, you couldn't just have Lincoln come in and say, you know what, served up, slavery's wrong, we're getting rid of it. He comes in and does that and it, it provokes a war. Right. Um, so in Russia, the czar simply signed a document saying you're free and that was it. There was no civil war. Anyway, uh, Alexander was killed and Nicholas uh, was ruling at a time of revolutionary violence and assassinations are taking place. There's all sorts of revolutionary parties that are denouncing the government, doing everything they can to, to, um, to, uh, to uh, undermine it. Um, and he just didn't have the character to rise to that occasion and, and, and rule effectively and do what needed to be done to rescue the state from the disaster that overtook it in 1917. So from our point of view, I think we would have to say he wasn't an effective ruler. Uh, there's no question he was not an effective ruler he, yeah and I'm, I'm glad you brought up um the serfs being free that was going to be uh, one of my next points uh another one would be and just piggybacking off of what you said about Tsar nicholas there uh the pascal edict of um i believe 1905 if i mm -hmm, remember my notes mm -hmm, right yeah but exactly that uh was and how that affected because that had a pretty prominent effect on <laughs> what's going to happen about 10 years later right Right. So the Paschal Edict of 1905 is the um, the long demanded um, recognition of Russia's multi-religious, the empire's multi-religious character. Um, as as in the case of all, like you might say, pre-modern European states, Russian law did not allow for the free practice of anything but orthodoxy. Um, and other religions, Judaism and Islam, both of which were big in Russia, as well as Roman Catholicism and Protestantism, both of which existed and in some cases were big in Western parts of Russia. Um, these religions were not 
given the same uh, freedom that Orthodox Christianity was. And uh, since Russia was a autocracy, no one had the right to vote for a representative to take the, their, their interests as a Muslim or a Roman Catholic to St. Petersburg, the capital, and get reforms, you know, that is out of the question. So Nicholas, again, he's resisted um, any changes after he comes to power in 1894. Uh, one of the pers- people that really subverted Nicholas's effectiveness was someone named Konstantin Pabodinotstev. He had the office that was known as the chief procurator of the Church. What was that? That was the position basically as a servitor or functionary of the of the czar's government to manage the bishops of the orthodox church to the benefit of the state itself Hmm. now nicholas ii himself was quite pious and wanted nothing but the best for the orthodox church but he inherited a system introduced by peter that as i said earlier radically fundamentally subverted the health of the orthodox church and since Nicholas was simply resisted any kind of changes, um, just because at this time change suggests radical revolution and Russia is kind of, you know, trying to stave that off as best she can, her government is, he resists this, um, these, these uh, any kinds of changes to the administration of the Russian Orthodox Church. By 1905, and I'm sorry, you ask a simple question, but you ask it of an historian and you get the long like my wife is always complaining that I always give her the story, you know, from Adam forward. Like I go all the way back to Adam and Eve and tell the story from that perspective. But your question was like, what is this 195 edict, this Easter edict? It granted finally religious freedom to the various various religions of the Russian Empire that they did not have prior to that. And Nicholas does so because in that year, uh, uh, an unsuccessful revolution had broken out in a connection with the war Russia was fighting against Japan at that time and losing badly. And so Nicholas was weakened and felt like he had to issue this edict in order to grant freedom of religion to, to, to reduce the tension and, uh, and hostility of all the non-Orthodox religious groups. And I might add, a lot of the Orthodox, I mean, significant number of Orthodox bishops and, and clergy also thought this was a good thing. Uh, they weren't afraid of, I mean, some of them were definitely afraid. My Orthodox patriots were afraid, but some Orthodox were not afraid of religious freedom. That was not something they thought was a bad thing. Right. And, and um, I, I should have mentioned, never feel, um, you know, tensitive about giving long answers. That's because <laughs> people don't want to hear me talk when they when they come on here. I can <laughs> promise you that. Um, yeah. I mean, so, so much of the book is spent... Um, talking about different whether it's patriarchs like i said before artists um people who are involved in politics writers and their uh, opinions or their particular avenue or trade or method of kind of selling whether it's patriotism nationalism whether it's against that idea um it, it would take forever probably to talk about each one of them but what are some of the main is arguments the right word some of the main methods or ethos uh that these folks would use in their dialogues back and forth to uh, convince folks of this position or any position really going on at this time. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think you're, you're referring to the kind of educated cultural elite of the mm-hmm. time, the painters, the philosophers, <clears throat> people like that, even some musicians, um, names we would recognize today um, found, found their way into this narrative. Like Tchaikovsky is a, a, a kind of a recognizable name in classical music among Americans. And if you have any doubts about Tchaikovsky, go to a, a mall. People don't go to malls anymore, but go to a, a whatever, a, a drugstore, a, a department store during um, the month before Christmas, and you'll hear Tchaikovsky's music. It's the Nutcracker Ballet being played all the time. Very American now. Or go to a July 4th uh, uh, fireworks festival, and you hear his 1812 overture being played. Well, that 1812 overture by Tchaikovsky, I won't take up every individual cultural figure, but that was commissioned to um, to commemorate the uh, the opening or consecration of a church in central Moscow called Christ the Savior Cathedral. Hmm. Now, today, that cathedral, though blown up by Stalin, has been rebuilt and continues to be a really 
prominent um, point of interest in Moscow. It's one of the largest Orthodox churches in the world. Um, and it was built in a new style, or I should say an old style, but that was new in Russia. Since Peter, or, or Orthodox churches were built in a Western Baroque kind of Protestant or Roman Catholic style. And it was under really Nicholas II and, and about that time, under the influence of Orthodox patriotism, that that uh, architecture in Russia was being built now in, in, in a medieval style, so-called, the Muscovite or Kievan style. So central dome, maybe uh, an onion dome, things like that, rather than a tall spire, which is maybe more typical of Western architecture, church architecture. Tchaikovsky was commissioned to... Per, uh, uh, com, uh, to um, compose a musical composition for when that church, Christ the Savior Cathedral, built with its its more uh, traditionally orthodox uh, architecture, uh, was opened. The work was called the 1812 Overture, and it's got its famous finale where the are, are being fired and stuff like da 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 dun dun using the Marseillaise. That's one example of a cultural figure who had his place in this Orthodox patriotism, that we're an Orthodox land, not a Roman Catholic, Protestant, or even worse, secular land. And we're going to locate our culture around uh, religious monuments, like Christ the Savior Cathedral, rather than what would the, the equivalent in Paris be at this time? The Eiffel Tower, <laughs> which, is, sure. which is built in 1889 uh, on the... 100 year anniversary of the fall of Bastille during the French Revolution. And to this day, uh, most people around the world and in France see the Eiffel Tower as the kind of mark or monument defining French identity. Um, and that's exactly what's going on is the Orthodox patriots are trying to use specifically Christian, Orthodox Christian monuments, musical compositions, things like that to define themselves against a secular post-Christian West, increasingly post-Christian West. Mm. So um, ultimately, this doesn't work, right? We have, you know, 1914, uh, Nicholas II takes Russia into World War I. 1917, we have the Bolshevik Revolution. And <clears throat> everyone knows the 100 years that <laughs> leading up to today, that basically that's what's taught to you in, you know, your general level education if you go through public school. Um, yeah. No one's, no one's going to hear anything about what you're writing in this book, which is why it's so fascinating. But um, I, I say that to say uh, maybe a, a good way to sort of sum up a lot of what you're writing here. Uh, why why doesn't it work? I mean, it, it seems, you know, we, we all know the ending to the story when we start reading the <laughs> book. And it's sort of like you, you have this... Uh, this tension gets built up because you know what's going to happen, but you're sort of hoping that maybe it's a dream and it doesn't happen. Um, but ultimately it does. So, you know, a really simple question to ask is just where does it go wrong? Yeah. Well, I guess I write the, the work in, in the kind of sense of a tragedy. You know, it starts off with hopes and ambitions and promises. And of course, it results in in the in the Bolshevik Revolution. It's it, actually the, the, the story really ends with the coming of World War One. But that war brings about the conditions that enabled the Bolsheviks to come to power. Mm. Um, so, and so why doesn't it work? Is that, is that your kind of your query? Yeah, exactly. yeah. 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 Just to talk about the, why it doesn't work. I think it doesn't work because it was, it was as much as it tried not to be ideological, it was. And I think that these um, Orthodox patriotic um, church leaders, uh, even if they were intellectuals who were, you know, Tchaikovsky, I don't really consider one, but he's kind of in that environment. And in the case of the 1812 overture I just mentioned, um, that's part, he's, he's kind of part of it, but a small part of it. I think the reason why these both clergy and laity um, who were invested in Orthodox patriotism failed was because they were just up against too much. I mean, there's the revolutionary movement was just way too strong. The division of the Russian Empire was way too um, advanced by that point. The leadership of the Russian Empire was uh, much too ineffective in the administration of Nicholas II. Um, and in the end, as I just said, it was in the end uh, a defense of, of, of Christianity uh, on an ideological level. And, and I think that's, that's why it just could never really work. 
And I think that's that's maybe something we can learn from today. I mean, I'm not a Russian. I have no business telling Russians what they should think and do and all this stuff. But but I wonder if 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 or if Orthodox Christianity, for instance, in Russia, and there are many religions in Russia today, but if Orthodox Christianity in Russia or Orthodox Christianity in Ukraine is to really be vital and transformative, if it's really to transform the world, which is what Christianity does, it transforms the world. That's the center of my whole narrative in the four volume series, uh, Paradise and Utopia. If, it, if, if Christianity is really gonna transform the world, it, it can't really depend upon as a crutch, worldly things such as ideologies. It has to come from a relationship with Jesus Christ. It has to come through a, a transformation, a spiritual transformation and a vision of the kingdom of heaven. And as much of that was found in Orthodox patriotism, in the end, there was a lot of ideology as well. And a lot of it was beautiful. And today you see in Russia a really kind of poignant and, and sometimes beautiful effort, and in Ukraine too, to uh, look to the past and to raise up examples of a past, a national culture that's beautiful and inspirational, that holds people together you know, whether it be national costumes or whatever celebrations of um, of national uh, history and national events, that if Christianity depends upon those largely earthly things, it's it's not going to be effective in the end. Well, you kind of read my mind a little bit there with where I was going to go next, and I only have a couple of questions left, but this is a, I mean, pretty impactful, I think, for, for people who are paying attention a little bit to geopolitics today, especially if they're Orthodox. Um, how, how, kind of because getting into the whole period of the USSR is, is murky and time consuming. How much of what's going on post, I mean, pre that 19, you know, the decades leading up to 1914, 1917, how much mm -hmm. of that now is um, impacting what happens post Soviet Russia and or maybe even post Yeltsin into the Putin mm -hmm. era? How much yeah. of impacting that uh, version of Russia that we see today and maybe a quick segue into the modern day situation in Ukraine as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like how you pointed out post Yeltsin because I think that is a really key difference here. Um, I lived in uh, St. Petersburg for a couple of years uh, under Yeltsin uh, during the Yeltsin period, <clears throat> mid nineties. <clears throat> and I was uh, astonished at how at the state of collapse mm -hmm. of values, of beliefs, of convictions, <clears throat> and how automatically uh, so many Russians I met just in, were trying to embrace the West and whatever the West had to offer. And sometimes that was good. I mean, seeing democracy in action, knowing the the secret police was gone, you know, knowing there had been a lot of freedom of religion was a reality now. Um, I could go to a, I went to a church, an Orthodox church there. I converted to Orthodox Christianity there in 1997. Um, I married a, a Russian woman that I had met there, uh, my wife now, um, who herself had converted, raised kind of not really anti-Christian, but was an atheist more or less. And, and then as an adult decided to convert to Orthodoxy in the 1990s, as I did there. Um, it was good in some ways, but it was also... Kind of astonishing in other ways to see how really rootless and unanchored the culture was in under Yeltsin. After Yeltsin's depart, you know, he he is out of the way and and then he's followed by Putin. Um, we've seen a real change in the attitude, uh, certainly the official attitude in Russia toward these questions of the relationship to the West and the place of the Orthodox Church. And, and I think we are returning, we have returned uh, to um, a situation where some of this Orthodox patriotism is really prominent, is really, is really now, again, being used um, in, in some good ways, but also some, some ideological and political ways to try to make sense of the world and, and lead Russia forward. And I think that that's, it's brought about some good things, and it's, it's also you know, introduce some problems that are probably not going to be resolved just mm -hmm. as they were not resolved before the revolution of 1917. Yeah. And what's going on in Ukraine is not, 
I mean, if you just look at what the local news talks about what's going on in Ukraine, I mean, it, it, it couldn't be more in my from my point of view, it couldn't be any further from the deep historical roots that the folks living there would have to be aware of. Right. That must go back generations and generations in their in their collective consciousness um, that it isn't just, you know, necessarily a land grab or, a, you know, just two political bullies or one. Uh, you know, Tyron and one underdog who's fighting the uphill David versus Goliath battle. There's so much history there. Yeah. Um, and there's so much going on in the Orthodox Church there. Um, you know, maybe maybe you could I don't want to make a whole second show out of it, but how uh, maybe help illuminate people a little bit to, you know, what's really happening there? What what are, what is really the dividing line here? What's really the conflict about? You know, I can't speak really with much authority on that, Adam, um, because I have not Certainly, I haven't been living in Russia for a long time, and I, I've never lived and even visited Ukraine, so I wouldn't want to say that I have any, you know, uh, feel of the pulse of the Ukrainian kind of way of thinking these days. I, I do think that that some of what I talk about in uh, the making of Holy Russia is being relived today uh, around Russia's relationship to the West, and uh, and connected to that, um, Russia's relationship. Uh, through through invasion and war with Ukraine. I think that, that there's a lot going on there that, that really is a revival of or a repeat, a revisiting of some of these issues. Not on the same terms by any means, um, but, but there are similarities. And so I think what you, you find in, in, in what I have seen going on in Russia today is among some people, I mean, there are plenty of people in Russia that are against this war. I mean, we, that's, that's clear. But there are a lot of people who are, you know, supportive and they're supportive because they sense that that their neighbor to the. Uh, has um, has now become more and more under the influence of a secular West that's likely to uh, to work to the detriment of Russia and and her culture, uh, which is very, very tentative right now. As I said, the 90s were a disaster for russia the disaster for the ukraine too in terms of culture and economics and such and there's been some rebuilding and and stability uh provided and and now it, i think the war is being fought partly for those reasons that there's just a sense of you know we have we have to uh address seriously the question of how, what's our relationship to the modern western world and its progressive whatever ideology yeah, and, and does that sort of, um, let's just call it Western influence for the sake of brevity, uh, play into the Orthodox Church in Ukraine versus the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, um, terms that Orthodox Christians are going to be familiar with, um, but a lot of Western Christians and even atheists or agnostics who listen aren't even going to know what that is. They may see an Orthodox Church in ruins on the television, but they might not understand the dynamic between these two seemingly... Uh, similar titled churches that are, uh, I guess, for lack of better words, under the influence of some different players. Yeah. You know, as an historian teaching, uh, you know, over, uh, you know, it's been a while I've been teaching uh, 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 since the 90s. Um, you know, one of the things I often, you know, kind of commented on in passing, didn't make too much out of it, but commented on is this, the relative historical absence in history of wars between Orthodox powers. There have been some examples of that, but not many. Only recently have we seen that happen uh, in the case of Russia and Georgia uh, some time back, I think, and, and then it's about 2008. And then uh, now again, so, pro, pro, you know, just so predominantly this war between uh, Russia and Ukraine. The, the churches and ruins that you speak of um, are Orthodox churches in most cases. And... Um, but they may belong to one or another jurisdiction of the Orthodox Church, which is a, a is a condition created by yes by the the growing influence of uh, external exiguous forces in Ukraine. So recently, for instance, an Orthodox um, uh, jurisdiction uh, uh, centered on Istanbul or Constantinople, named the Ecumenical Patriarch uh, Bartholomew. Um, created an a so-called auto uh, autonomous or autocephalous church in Ukraine rather obviously you kind of defined against the Russian Orthodox Church whose 
patriarch is in Moscow, Kirill. And uh, Orthodox Christianity historically has always had a place for the creation of autocephalous regions, often defined by nationality, uh, sometimes by empires like Byzantium, but sometimes by nationality. And so that's not necessarily, you know, a, a big issue. It's just the way it was done. And so you have these two different Orthodox churches now for your audience that's not Orthodox, that this might be a helpful kind of clarification to be made, both of whom are fighting, you know, or involved in, in, in conflict um, on, on between two powers that are Ukraine or Russia, and they're fighting each other now. And that's a disaster from any point of view, but especially from an Orthodox Christian's point of view. That should not be happening. And um, the motivation for doing this you know, uh, sadly, in some cases will be nationalism, nationalism, an ideology of nationalism, rather than a desire to, you know, for the very best thing for the Orthodox Church's life and, and health. Yeah, I mean, amen to that. And, and we and we pray every liturgy for cessation to the war in Ukraine. I mean, it's... it's yes, it's, we do too here at our church. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, uh, we, we do talk about geopolitics a lot on the show. I'm not going to get into it with you out of respect and but i do have a question for you maybe more so as as clergy than historian but you're welcome to answer however you'd like um and maybe we could close on this and i'll see if you have any other uh, other thoughts but how does you know let's let's assume the vast majority of people who are going to be listening to me are going to be lay people and a good percentage of those folks are going to be orthodox christians um how do we me how do i uh approach something like politics and secularism and ideologies and the news and the presidents and all of these all of these geopolitical forces going on um, as an Orthodox Christian knowing full well they're going to continue to happen even if I ignore them happening you know like there's a way to process these in real time without falling into traps that conflict with Christian understanding or Christian worship and I think it's at least as uh, at least important to ask you know as many folks in a clerical position or in positions of esteem within the church you know what their advice is on something like that because it's it may or may not be easy for someone to know how to decipher or discern the right move and i i know will appeal appeal always to someone's individual spiritual father or you know something like that but um yeah sometimes it's helpful to just hear it from other folks too yeah and yeah and so uh, what I would say uh, to that very good question, Adam, you know, as I preach here at our own, uh, at my church here in, in, in Palsma, Washington, um, ide again, ideology is a thing to watch out for, which by which I mean things that root us in this world. We Christians have no abiding city here on earth. We just actually heard that at the, at the, um, at the divine liturgy yesterday um, as one of the readings. Uh, it's from Hebrews. We have no abiding city here on earth. We have no investment in this world. That doesn't mean we don't care about this world. God so loved the world he gave to it his only begotten son. And so if we're going to be like God, and that's what we're called to be as Christians, we've got to love the world. But we've got to love the world salvifically. We've got to love the world in a way that transforms the world spiritually and, and brings the kingdom of heaven into the world. And the kingdom of heaven is not of this world, even though through the liturgical life of the church, it's come into the world and has been here since Pentecost. And so what we as, I think, Orthodox Christians especially, and that's all I can really speak for, what we need to do is practice asceticism, right? And we have such a great tradition of this. We Orthodox Christians fast every Wednesday and Friday throughout the year, almost every single one. We have four fasting seasons. Um, where we're fasting for long periods of time, especially the one before before Pascha or Easter, we are always called to to look into our hearts and to see where they're corrupted by 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 demonic or earthly passions that are causing harm not only to us but to the people around us. If we're doing that, I think we'll be in a good position um, together. You know, surrounding as it were the uh, the, 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 the chalice and the gospel at the divine liturgy will be in a good position to discern what role we have to, in this world uh, in the issues that you raised and the issues that will always be here. Um, we will be in a good position to discern 
what word to speak and what actions to do to bring the kingdom of heaven into this world. And uh, I think if we're practicing that ascetical tradition, we're following that ascetical tradition, I think we're going to be able to, we'll be equipped to do that. Amen. And I, I think that's going to be, I pray that will be helpful to to folks listening. I, I think you can't hear a message like that enough from enough people. <laughs> I think that's probably what we what we want to kind of uh, close on. But I, I do want to ask you, is there anything that we didn't cover? Um, you know, I, I had, I could go on for hours and hours, but I, I tried to make sure I, my notes were in that kind of 90 minute range. Is there anything we didn't cover that you feel like maybe we should bring up here at the end to just, uh, or do you think that kind of like close it out? I think that's good. I, I I don't, I mean, there's a lot in the book, you know, that I love uh, talking about, thinking about, right. I loved writing about it, but I think we've covered the, uh, the big points. Yeah, I think we have. Well, I'll hold it up again here for everybody. Uh, the making of Holy Russia, Father John Strickland. And uh, just a reminder, if, you know, for some reason, somebody tuned in in the middle of this episode, uh, Father John is also the author of the Paradise and Utopia series that we are going through, um, you know, chapter by chapter on the show. And uh, I'm very appreciative for his time, very appreciative for his work um, and uh, and thank him very much for coming on on the show. Is there uh, any where you'd like to direct anyone to content? I know you were sort of doing a podcast version of Paradise and Utopia for a while, 2021, 2022. Is that still a thing now that the books are written or is it? Kind <laughs> yeah, of my my editor at Ancient Faith uh, Radio would like it to be more of a thing than it is, I think. I. I haven't con I haven't added any content to that recently, um, but I do intend to finish it up to bring it up to the present. The book series, Paradise and Utopia, Rise and Fall of What the West Once Was, is really the main thing I have to say. The podcast was designed to support that and kind of generate ideas that, that would go into that. Uh, the other place one can find me is on or, uh, johnstrickland.org, which is my um, blog. It's like an historical blog. And it too is pretty out of date, um, but but also one can contact me through those through that um, johnstrickland.org uh, if they like to and and read some of the content there. Yeah, wonderful. And I'll I'll as always I'll link everything in in the show notes for everybody and uh, for the listeners, you you guys and gals, y'all know where to find me. You can message me on Facebook. You know I try to avoid other social media. Every time I go on Twitter, there's a mess and a disaster, and it puts me in a bad mood for days. So I just try to stay off of that stuff. Facebook is great. Message me. You can always send me an email. Again, at adam at theageofinformation.com. Um, I always respond. Uh, and I will highlight, if it's not clear on Facebook if you are a real person or not, you're going to have to message me to, just to confirm I am not a, uh, I am not a bot. I am not a, you know, trying to spam your profile. But uh, that's so you guys get in touch with me. Please go ahead, like, subscribe, comment, and share. Um, we're going to link to Father John Strickland's content here. Um, and I think that's going to be it for us this week. So this episode will drop uh, the Friday of my wedding, this coming Friday. Oh, so when this drops, congratulations. Drop, <laughs> thank you very much. And I know you just had a conversation with Buck Johnson. As we're recording, it will drop tomorrow. Uh, as people are hearing this, it would have been four days ago. So we're doing all kinds of time traveling here. <laughs> at the end of the episode so um yeah definitely check uh, father john out there i appreciate everybody for listening for now guys be safe be well and we will talk to you soon